Welcome to the 455th episode of the Jamie Delaney Plant-Based Wellness Podcast, Plant-Based Wellness and Running Podcast. My name is Jamie Delaney and I'm your host. I'm a plant-based cardiologist and endurance athlete in Southwest Florida. Welcome and thanks for listening. If you're one of my followers, you know we talk nutrition and wellness, but we also talk a little bit about running because I believe that movement is part of being healthy and running is my favorite form of movement. And anytime I can learn anything about running, uh, I enjoy that. And if you've listened to this podcast for a lot of episodes, you know that intermittently I get injured running, as do many runners. Um, I didn't start out as a runner. I didn't run in high school. I started running really in medical school um, to actually run a distance, maybe two or three miles, um, to burn off a few calories. But I didn't start running seriously till I was almost 40. I ran my first marathon in 2000, which was the Rome Marathon. And I started from running three miles uh, and worked my way up to the marathon from, uh, we'll say, October to the marathon was in March. And after I ran the marathon, I got the bug, and so I wanted to go faster and, uh, you know, end up getting injured. I've had a few stress fractures, um, not bad ones, you know, tibia, toes. Um, I've had three episodes of back issues where I have pain in my hips, sciatica type thing, which are all attributed to running and overuse injuries for the most part. I've had a couple Achilles injuries. Um, and over the time, I've been fortunate enough to meet uh, a running coach, a cross-country coach from upstate New York that helped me alter my form before that first marathon because I actually started out injured training for my first marathon. I had a tendonitis of the patella and I was told by a sports medicine doctor that if you run, you're going to have knee pain. Um, but between this coach and a friend that was a trainer for the Buffalo Bills, um, I don't think he listens to the podcast, but shout out Bud Carpenter. Um, I learned to run without any knee pain after that first marathon. Um, and, you know, again, I've had to tweak things. Most of the time has been overuse, so trying to bump up mileage or speed or both at the same time. But I've changed my form over time. I've went from a heel striker to a midfoot striker. I've tried to get my center mass underneath me, um, you know, started doing some cross training. And nevertheless, you know, I've, I've had intermittent injuries and have become a student of running injuries, so to speak. It was while I was looking at um, different back and uh, mobility as far as low back and glute act activation that I came across today's podcast guest. Um, his name is Matt Minard. And uh, Dr. Minard, or Matt, Dr. Matt is a physical therapist. He has a PhD in physical therapy, he trained at Dayton University. And he um, started his career doing physical therapy on injured people for various kind. And he worked at a gym and he uh, coached Orange Theory. And he um, saw running injuries. And when COVID hit, people were running outside. He started to see more running injuries because people would run outside because they didn't have anything else to do. So he decided to be proactive and try to develop some hints uh, so that people might not get injured if they could change their running mechanics before they got injured and possibly get faster. But the idea is to become more, more efficient and run further longer. Um, you know, it has been my belief, and I've shared on this podcast before, that um, you're too old not to run. I think you can run at any age. I think you have to have a little form tweaking. Um, again, you have to work up to it. Typically, people go out too fast, too strong, too long. Uh, you get excited. Um, so it is, you know, the little tendons and muscle imbalances start to show their, their weary head. So if you can educate yourself a little bit about some of the techniques, um, you know, you might stay running longer um, as far as consistent. Because I think once you get the running bug, you, you feel, you know, there's something about flying the difference between running and walking is that when you run, both feet are in the air for some period of time, even if it's microseconds. So once you've experienced that flying while moving, um, I think people start to enjoy it. And it's a quick way to get your cardiovascular exercise in. It's a great way to see 
a new town or in, in you know a new environment, explore a trail, play with your kids, play with your grandkids. Great way to stay in shape. So, um, you know, I encourage anybody to take up the sport of running. My colleagues in medicine have asked me over the years, don't your knees hurt? Don't you have, you know, problems? And the answer is no. Um, and I think that that has to do with, again, my attention to detail and form, but I also think it has to do with nutrition and decreased inflammation. I've noticed since I've been plant-based, I recover a lot more quickly after a marathon or after a hard training session. I've learned to fuel my body with carbohydrates, of all things, um, to help speed up recovery. Uh, fruit after um, you know, an endurance event helps to get the glycogen scores, uh, stores back up quickly, but also provides a lot of antioxidants. So I've learned that. But um, again, I'm still learning on how to be a more efficient, better, faster, stronger runner um, with endeavors down the road. So I look forward to many more running years. And hopefully with some of the tips that Dr. Miner um, has discussed here in the podcast, you will too. So I hope you do enjoy it. Um, His um, YouTube videos, Instagram clips are uh, under the the heading Learn to Run. So like uh, it's Learn in the number to run. And I'll I'll certainly leave that in the show notes. And, um, you know, check out his website. He does some coaching. He does some videos if you're interested as well. Uh, And I I hope you enjoy the podcast. All right. Well, I would like to welcome Dr. Matt Menard to the podcast this evening. I stumbled upon your Instagram account by looking at running reels. Um, We talked a little bit earlier. Um, I've been running since I think my first marathon was in the year 2000. I grew up a golfer, so I really learned to run um, the injury type way. Actually, I had severe plant or I said severe patellar knee. tendonitis before I ran my first marathon, went to a sports medicine doctor and he said, if you're going to run, you're going to have knee problems. So um, luckily, I also had a a friend of a family that was the trainer for the Buffalo Bills. He said, that's nonsense. You've got to do this, this and this. He hooked me up with a running um, coach that, you know, had a cross country team upstate New York and kind of fixed my form a little bit, but that still didn't really keep me from doing injury. So, uh, injury free. So I'm honored to talk to you, pick your brain. We have a similar type of practice in that you and I both are into prevention. You're into preventing injuries before they happen uh, and helping people to have better movement skills. And uh, I'm trying to prevent people from having cardiovascular disease and, and some degree keep from falling down as well and to keep moving. So they all go together. And I think uh, should be a, a fun, a fun um, conversation. You were, you know, you, you were a, a physical therapist, active, doing traditional physical therapy work, fixing broken people. Uh, and then the pandemic hit and you started looking into how to prevent. So tell me a little bit about your evolution from being a uh, fix it to prevent it kind of guy. Yeah, I'm kind of, it's a gift and a curse. I always <laughs> feel like I have to be trying to improving in some aspect, whether mental or physical. And my kind of mantra is green and growing or brown and dying. So pretty much since, you know, when you graduate, that's where the learning really just begins. And so I spent about eight years just continuing to try to learn as many different methods, many different ways to communicate so I could just let the least amount of people slip through the cracks. But there became a point where I realized where everyone that was coming to me was already injured. And some people don't have the financial resources or the time to be able to really carve that out and come in and get the the help that they need. So I just started thinking, like, how can we reach the masses? How can we try to save money on all the healthcare expenses and I've even had one time where I kind of did the math on somebody where she was having chronic knee and, and ankle issues. And just in one session, kind of teaching her how to glide, move horizontal, take the jump out and seeing her the follow up. She was she could have saved thousands of dollars on MRIs and doctor's appointments when someone just needed to teach her how to move a little bit more efficiently. So I got to the point in 2020 when the pandemic started 
I was just trying to find something to do mentally to kind of also help myself and also try to help people. And everyone was running outside, but everyone was getting injured. So I just started Instagram, learn to run. And it just slowly over time just evolved to the point where I didn't really have anything to sell. I was just giving information, but people were wanting more. They were wanting training plans. They're running mechanics, other physical therapists and coaches were trying to learn some of the, the technique because there really isn't a whole lot out there that's simplified and, and repeatable. And, um, and so then I just started to keep growing. I did an online business. And so my, my main mission is helping the world run safer, trying to see, can we prevent these injuries? Can we use movement as medicine to try to help with an outlet for anxiety or stress or overall health, whatever the case is, just having a, a way to do it a little bit safer. So I've just been reverse engineering and trying to simplify with the main purpose of making it easy to understand, uh, scalable to the masses. So I guess maybe we can start with, well, I, you know, curiosity. Um, what do you think is the most common running injury that you see? So most often knees, for sure. And I've kind of whittled down to the three essential skills. These three skills are what we need to learn to be able to just kind of master efficiency of running. What that means is running is just about moving forward. And I use the analogy of it's like paying on a mortgage of a house. Every payment you make, we want to try to have as much of that principle going towards the goal of paying off the house. When we're running, the energy we're exerting, we want as much of it to go towards that principle of moving forward as possible. If it's not helping move forward, we're paying on the interest. So the three skills that aren't automatic are one arm swing. The arm should swing forward and back, forward and back in sync with the legs. And the arm's main role is to help assist the legs. If the arms aren't helping, the legs actually have to work harder to overcome that. And a lot of times the pathway people are swinging in their arms is they're going up and down, kind of like they're axing. Bra, gra, versus, finding the bra, I've heard of the an analogy, grab your bra strap as yeah. you come up and, and then, there's like cheek and then, to and cheek then or, hit, your, hit yourself in the, you know, so it's a lot more of that motion. Yeah, that, that's what people with up and down. So that's what I'm mm -hmm. trying to show. It's more like a handsaw, forward and back, forward and back. And the movement's mainly coming from the shoulder girdle, not to the elbows. The next is the lean. In order to maximize our momentum, to minimize breaking, no matter what, anytime our foot's out in front of us, anytime our base of support is in front of our center of mass, there's going to be some breaking or slowing that's occurring. So how can we minimize that? teaching people how to lean, how to shift their entire body weight forward, hinging at the ankles, the ankle. That way I kind of bring my center of mass forward, which approximates the base support and the center of mass. So having that lean is really what sets up our landing to try to maximize momentum. And the third is the most challenging, but I think probably the most influential is the gliding. Learning to leave the ground and move purely horizontal by pushing backwards, push with the tush, not pushing downwards through the ground, using the calves, using the quads concentrically and going up and forward. Mm -hmm. So learning to really take the jump about what I'll say. So those three skills are what I've really learned to try to whittle it down. I found other things that I used to try to crack for in the past. Like if someone has a pelvic drop, if they're going side to side, and we thought just strength and strength and strength. And well, a lot of times, like if someone's riding a bike and they're going too slow and they're going side to side, we don't really cue the lean. We just cue to actually push a little bit harder, a little bit more force. So a lot of times teaching people how to have the lean and how to actually push the ground backwards. And the analogy I like is if I'm in a canoe, how I move forward is I put the paddle in the water, which is like your leg, and you push the water back and you move forward. So that kind of helps to conceptualize if I'm leaning and pushing back, I don't really have time to go around about or circumduct, or then I don't really need to pick the paddle all the way up out of the water actively each time. So kind of showing that kind of gliding and, and um, having the, always going back to some kind of analogy that people can relate to. And I think that canoe analogy is hopefully helpful in saying, you know, how do we propel? How can we actually move ourselves forward and pushing back and not pushing down and back? Yeah, I think that's, um, you know, some really key concepts because, again, when I first started running, you know, I started, like I said, when I transitioned, it's like, what can I do while my daughter's playing soccer? So I start running around the field. And it was obviously, if you go from walking to running, the next first thing people do is a heel strike and way out in front of you. 
And, you know, so I was landing with my foot in front of my center of mass with my leg extended. And so I was jamming my leg. And so when I, you know, was finally taught to land under my center of mass, all of a sudden that part went away. Um, but it's a, it's a very difficult concept to get back underneath your center of mass. Um, you see people leaning from the waist or um, what I, you know, um, my boyfriend described me when he first start when we first met running that I was going more side to side than forward mm -hmm. you know I was trying to get under my center of mass but I wasn't efficient because I was just bobbing up and down or side to side mm -hmm. uh, and figuring out how to put power into the ground it's a lot like a golf it is a lot like a golf swing in that if you just you know kind of don't put any force into and just, you know, you're swinging your arms, but not using your body. You're, you're all over the place. Yeah. You have to put some force into the ground to move forward. Um, I think that glute activation just escaped me for the longest period of time. And when I tried, you know, some of your cues, it's like, okay, then that helps me to actually give me a cue to activate my glutes as I'm going, as opposed to trying to figure out you know, how do I get these things, you know, pushing down? Because you see the track people, you know, again, like the golf swing, people can tell you 6,000 things you're doing wrong, but you mm -hmm. can't fix 6,000 things. You've picked out three things to do that actually take mm -hmm. a lot of the problems out. Yeah, and it's like we can only focus on one thing. I've been guilty of giving people five cues at once and they become so paralyzed by the possibilities they don't even know how to move at all. But like, I'm trying to switch the framework of instead of thinking about the landing, instead of thinking about the foot in front of you, think about the ground and your perspective at the ground and think about roll the earth back, push the earth back. And the nice thing is that when we have that slight lean, we just, we set ourselves up that we really do bring that um, kind of base support, that sweet spot of where we land. We actually bring our feet under us more by leaning forward. And the reason why it is a learning skill, like you talked about too, with leaning, is naturally we don't want to fall. We always want to be in balance and equilibrium. So what happens if I normally lean forward, I have my hips go back, my shoulders go forward. So I'm, I'm hinging, I'm leaning, but I'm leaning at the hips. But if we looked at where the pressure was under my feet, under my base support, it's still centered because I want to stay centered. I don't want to fall. So it's a learned skill to keep everything stacked, transfer my pressure of my feet towards the ball of my foot, which is creating this slight constant forward lean. But when we're in that position, that brings that um, the base support and the um, center mass closer. So you don't even really have to think about the landing, which a lot of times when we're thinking about the landing, we're either, we could be reaching, but you'll find the only time if someone's landing on their heel, when it's inappropriate, they're not leaning. They're either vertical and upright. So their center of mass is back or they're leaning, but they're leaning what we just talked about. We're hinging at the hips. They're leaning forward at the hips. And if I'm leaning at the hips, my center of mass is still back. So the name of the game is try not to have our center of mass back behind. It's how can we bring the two as close together as possible. And I kind of think of the analogy to like a shopping cart. You know, if you're pushing a shopping cart, you don't want to bonk your shins. It doesn't feel good. If I'm upright, it's a lot easier for me to have my legs go out in front of my body and hit my shins. If I just have that ever so slight forward lean, my feet actually are just naturally under me more. So it's harder to bonk your shins. You don't have to think about it. And that's why a lot of times I see people with running with baby strollers, they do have a, a little bit better of a stride pattern because they they have to lean to kind of overcome some of that and they don't want to hit the kick the baby. <laughs> so uh, just really, I've, I'm trying to think what's the least we could think about to accomplish the goal and cues sometimes work for people. Sometimes just videoing yourself and seeing yourself in slow motion. You'd be amazed at how much you can learn just by seeing yourself from a side view in slow motion. I have something I've been using for a couple of years now. We're finally going to do it in some research where I have a tennis ball necklace where I take a tennis ball, I fill it with pennies, I attach a shoelace to it like a necklace, and I have it go around the runner near their center of mass, near their belly button. And I give them the cue. I want you to run forward in such a way that keeps the ball as quiet and as still as possible. And it is so cool to subconsciously see people figure it out. If it's, they're going up and down, the ball goes up and down, it's going to hit them in the stomach. It's going to make a noise. If they're overstriding or breaking, if they're slowing themselves down, the ball actually continues to move forward. I stay back. 
and the ball comes back and hits me. And seeing people get that immediate feedback. It's not we stop, we look at slow motion, let's try it again. Getting that in action, getting that feedback, you can really learn a lot. And then it's let's mimic the mechanics. Can we run the same way with the ball on versus off? And can we keep that ball, which is kind of like an external representation of the center of mass, can we just try to keep that as fluid and as smooth as possible? Yes, there has to be some breaking forces. Yes, there's going to be some up and down, but it really should be more of a down up than an up down, meaning when we land, eccentrically the muscles are acting, we're cushioning like shock absorbers, but then we're returning to the position that we were, trying not to go up above my height. And that's why I've used drills um, for feedback because we're on a treadmill, which it is harder to teach that gliding teaching push the ground backwards on a belt that's also moving backwards but sometimes it's just what people prefer i'll make like an artificial ceiling i'll have them stand vertically and i'll have like those things at the doctor's office measuring height and i attach a cardboard to it and i measure it to exactly their height when they're standing and what happens ideally we soften the knees and we have that lean forward and when we're leaving the ground we're moving horizontal and down so we stay under that the whole time so giving the cue don't bonk your head either just as a cue or actually as a drill just teaching people to move horizontal because knee issues knee injuries patellofemoral pain syndrome if i'm not leaning my center of mass is back behind the axis of the knees so there's more loading on the kneecap if i'm using my ankles and my knees to concentrically push down through the ground to go up i'm loading my knees a lot more so the, the caveat is it's all on flat we need to at least learn the efficient mechanics on a flat surface and then when it comes to going uphill or downhill we can modify or adjust appropriately we match our lean to the lean of the incline or the decline we naturally there's going to be some things that are going to change but we at least need to all kind of agree upon what's the most efficient way to move forward optimizing our momentum maximizing the distance between each step can we either do less work at the same speed or can you which is safer or can you choose to use that same amount of effort but pay more on the principal than the interest and go faster so people it's sexy to go faster most people like that S safety isn't sexy people don't care about safety until they're hurt then they really care about it but uh, i find most of my demographics the people that really appreciate the information are people that were either injured and they weren't able to run for a while or people that are in like 30, 40, 50, 60 years old where they appreciate the value of movement and you've only got one car your whole life. And it can be a good car, but you got some miles on it. And I want you just to be able to treat your car the way that can have this be for the long, the long run. So, and the key too is even just like with anything, it's all about uh, adaptation. If you can stimulate and stress the body, the body will adapt. And just like if you are allergic to, to bees, we'd give you just a little bit in a shot not too much. We don't want to overdo it. And over time, we slowly increase that. That same with impact and force. It's all about the force and gravity. We're trying to see, can we slowly over time give you more impact or let your body tolerate more impact? And guess what? Your bones will get stronger, your bone density. You can have all these positive changes. Um, and to tell people not to do something just for the sake of not doing it, not weighing out all the other factors, uh, I think that's where we can kind of get in trouble. I think there's some people that were like, I'd rather have my knees hurt, have a knee replacement and feel just the mental, how good I feel physically and mentally than not run at all and be sedentary, which can also come with a lot of other orthopedic issues. Oh, as absolutely. Well, so. I was just thinking as you were talking about the tennis ball, um, you know, when I assess people's posture, um, you know, you either have the people that lean at the waist and they, so they never really get up or overcompensating and they're kind of leaning back to start with. Yep. Um, and that tennis ball trick might be actually good for even just basic posture, because if your basic posture is right, that tennis ball should be steady, even in a walking, correct? Yeah, so I, I kind of teach standing first, leaning, walking, and then running. And I use the tennis ball. I have a course online where I teach those three skills that I mentioned earlier with the tennis ball necklace for feedback. Mm -hmm. I actually first teach arm swing. And what should happen is when you're standing, everything's stacked. Before we're even talking about the leaning, if my arms are appropriately swinging forward and back, the ball will just naturally spin in the transverse plane around the vertical axis. If I'm not doing it correctly, the ball will go side to side. It will go up and down and make noise. So that's the feedback is the ball spinning vertically. Then the lean, teaching how to lean forward, hinging at the ankles, the ball should still make contact with their body if they're doing it right. 
if they're leaning at the hips, the ball goes out in front of them. So that, that's, I do like that for that cue of teaching people that ankle how to hinge forward, leaning at the ankles, using that tennis ball necklace. I've also used it for teaching people squatting, deadlifting, just how can we, we know the goal, we know the arrows, the directions of the movement. How can we give them some kind of feedback, whether it be visual, verbal, or tactile, to then take that feedback away so they can truly learn? But yeah, you can start to get creative with it. And that's what I love is, is teaching people at the courses too. Like, what's the concept? Can you find other creative cues or ways? Because I don't have all the answers. Everyone has, there's so many different ways to kind of learn the same skill and people respond differently. What one, one cue might help somebody could be completely different for somebody else. And I, I learned a lot of that with an Orange Theory, being on a microphone and just playing around with seeing people's movement patterns and saying, you know, don't bunk your head. See what happens. Keep your feet close to the ground. See what happens. Don't kick your butt. Just so many different ways and seeing how does that change their posture or not change their posture. Just have this arsenal of tools. And that's what makes it fun is kind of trying to pick out what do I think this person's going to be most responsive to? Is it a verbal cue? Is it a tactile cue? Are they a visual learner? What kind of learner are they? So we can just expedite the learning process. And once they learn these skills, um, that's what's kind of cool. The body takes the path of least resistance. It wants to do less work, right? If I drop something, if I don't really think about it, my body is going to lock my knees and I'm going to bend at the hips, use gravity, my back, and then I'm going to use my back to lift. It's less work versus using my legs to lower my body and lift. I don't consciously do that automatically because it's more effort. Once you can learn to move horizontal and learn how to not jump, there's no going back. I have to consciously now make an effort in my videos to show the differences to actually push down and go up and it's exhausting. And so that's why a lot of times what's nice is once you do learn this, and I don't want you to think about your mechanics forever, but just for a short period of time, can you think about it now? So then you can automate it. It's just the way that you move. And that's a crazy old school thought that you can't change the way that you run. That's ridiculous. Running is how we move forward. Squatting is how we lower. We can teach movement. We can teach efficiency of movement and which muscles and how to all that stuff. So you can learn it and it gets to a point where you don't have to think about it. And my goal for everybody is just to be able to zone out, go on a long run, clear their head, do whatever it is and not have to think about their mechanics. But for a short period of time, we do need to, to, to think about it. Let me ask you a question. Um, you know, give you the, uh, I'll be the hype. I'll, I'll be, well, it's a real patient. So I, I can go, um, you know, so now I'm running ultra. So long, slow distance, I'm good to go. Um, you know, I decide I want to increase my marathon PR and I start adding speed work along with volume and I typically throw my back out. Um, at one point, uh, I will tell you that I was watching, have you watched Jim Walmsley run? So he's got this giant, so he's a really good long distance runner, but he's also, you know, early 30s and, you know, probably 6'2". <laughs> You know, so I'm five, six and 61. So, you know, his short mother, basically. And so all of a sudden I'm watching, you know, him with this big, long extension behind him, you know, this big, long stride. And so I was like, I'm going to extend my legs like Jim Walmsley, you know, behind me and do this extension. Well, I end up basically what I end up doing is I ended up extending my legs at the at the expense of arching my back yeah as opposed to keeping stacked yeah so I, I, my core wasn't engaged and so my hip flexor so instead of you know so instead i would just collapse and of course then i would end up you know so my answer to speed work would always end up being that my core would give out so to speak and i would you know impinge something and whether it was zoas or whatever it was i would end up you know, with some sort of form of sciatica, uh, you know, butt pain, yeah. hip pain, knee pain, someplace, you know, and it could be hip to hip. It wasn't, doesn't necessarily have to be the same one, uh, yeah. but it would, it would take me out. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I was very, you know, so obviously mobility and keeping my quads loose are one of the things, but I'm scared to death to try to bump speed up in the presence of volume because I, I lose my form. Yeah. yeah what, I do have a what do you think I'm losing? A, what, what, so what causes me to lose what I'm losing? 
So I have the, the, the not so fantastic form for four common form faults that cause low back pain. And what you're describing is what I call more of a, a lumbar locker where it, it could be a mobility issue. You don't have the ability to get your thigh behind you, or it could be a firing issue. Let's start with mobility. If I'm missing hip extension, mm-hmm. if my hip flexors are tight, what will happen is as I go to try to extend my thigh behind my body, if I run out of real estate or my hip flexor is now pulling, I will try to arch my back and lean to try to get my leg back there. And so then we need to address the range of motion, gain it, and then we retrain it. The other is ankle dorsiflexion. If we don't have the ability of the knee to go past the toe when we're in that stance phase, we will compensate by finding somewhere up in the system, usually at the hip or the spine, to try to overcompensate for that. Or we'll see some twisting that can actually occur. Like I have this screen for hip mobility that I'll do where you take a a dowel or a stick or a broom and you measure the height of from the ground to the bottom of your kneecap. I think mine's 17 inches. And so then I go to the wall, I go 17 inches away from the wall, and what I try to do is keep the broom or the stick on my back, be balanced, and can I extend my hip and tap the wall behind me without arching, without leaning, without the stick coming off? That will give me an idea, do I have enough motion? If I don't, how I could cheat and still get there is I could rotate. I could tap into the transverse plane, and now I go back further, but now we're interjecting more torsion or twisting into the system. So if it's not a mobility issue, what it commonly is, is not tapping into the glutes, whether they're using hamstring dominant, where they're arching their back. And I'll also do a test where a a standard bridge, where you go on your back, knees bent. I'll say, all right, lift your hips up. I want to see what happens. So essentially closed chain hip extension. What you'll see a lot of times is people will push through between their shoulder blades. They'll arch, they'll push down through the ground, and that's arching their low back as opposed to squeezing the glutes, I'll say, grab an acorn, grab a penny, try to break that acorn as you squeeze your glutes and your glutes lift up, don't arch your back. If you feel that pressure increasing between your shoulder blades, that means you're arching. Can we learn to single out and isolate the glutes? But then we can't stop there because that's not how we run. Now let's go in standing. Let's go next to a mirror. All right, let's look sideways. I want you to balance on one leg and extend your thigh behind you, kind of open chain hip extension. And once you get all the way back, look, what do you see? Are you having that locked out lumbar spine or the lordosis? Are you extending using that? Does your spine still stay in that position, but getting that feedback? So most commonly, it's either people just technique aren't leaning. They're a lumbar locker. They don't realize, oh, we do want to lean forward. We don't want to have the ribs flared. We lock out the low back for stability instead of having the true core. And then the facets are compressed. The ground reaction forces because our center of mass is back more breaking on top of a locked spine or it's the firing pattern where they're not truly pushing with a tush or using their glutes and they're using their spine to try to assist or it's a mobility restriction either hip flexors or ankle dorsiflexion is the is the culprit then again you got to gain it and then retrain it give someone more range of motion and then train them how to fire in that new that new range and giving cues throughout just maybe put your fingertips on your glute max and see, notice how when you do that, feel how the muscle actually hardens and pushes your fingers out. So can we do that same movement? Let's take away that feedback so you don't become a rely on it. Got it? Okay, check again. Got it. Just teaching people how to maximize and how to move and which muscles to truly activate. But um, that's one of the most common ones I see for low back pain is the lumbar locker. Yeah, I, I pretty much checked all those boxes as she would go. <laughs> it's so common, though. Yeah, it is. And yeah, it is. You start yeah. to see patterns like that. It is. Uh, and I, you know, I mean, it, it is pretty funny. I mean, I laugh about it when I'm not. And, of course, I, you know, I swear by I'm going to be a good mobility girl. Uh, and then, you know, when I'm, you know, you let it go and then it comes back and rears its ugly head. But as I go further and, of course, I, I think I've really done it like three times, you know, now I, I, you know, it's like, okay, okay, okay. So I, I'm pretty, I'm pretty conscious about doing my mobility stuff. Um, but yeah, the glute activation is, is something that I continue to work on. Um, there's a guy, um, are you familiar with a, a, a PT named Ryan Peebles at all? Have you seen any of his stuff, core balance training? 
Um, maybe he's seen it, but, I, but the yeah, uh, I, it goes along the same way because that's I, probably how I end up stumbling onto your site was kind of from his site because again it comes back to that same activation, activating the glutes, connecting the core so that your lumbar back stays still, and then advancing that to a walking, running movement type pattern. Um, and I think that's you know how I then you know you're kind of a one step running pro- progression of all of that. Um, but it, it, if it's not natural, you know, you do have to think about these things, you know, and I think that we don't think about those things and you, people get in trouble and they say, oh, I can't, or, you know, I, I always laugh in the doctor's lounge. Every time I end up in the doctor's lounge, people say, are you still running? You know, don't your knees hurt? I had to quit running because I played football in high school. And it's like, what was that 40 years ago? You know, you're blaming yeah. for 40 years ago, something happened. I really don't think that's right. really an issue. <laughs> And, you know, and it's like, so my knees don't hurt anymore. You know, I've never had a, a knee issues since, you know, I got that figured out. But um, and I think so many people say they can't run because of back or knee or hip or things like that. But it's just, again, um, we get these movement patterns that are, you know, not a little bit wonky. And we just keep mm-hmm. doing the same thing over and over again. And so you, and, you know, I, I got in an argument with my nurse one time because, well, I guess the last time I threw my back out, she's like, well, why don't you just rest? You know, why don't you just rest? And it's like, well, because if I just rest and don't do anything, then that means that all the training that I've done, I have to let it completely go down to, you know, okay, I'm placid again. <laughs> And then, re- yeah. you know, and then, and I'm starting from scratch. There's got to be a way that I don't have to go for, to scratch again, you yeah. know? And uh, so it becomes, you know, how do you do these movement patterns and do them in a the correct way that you you don't have to just stop what you're doing, but you adjust and go on uh, mm-hmm. in a way. So that, that those cues are, you know, excellent. Um, and again, I'll put links to this, you know, your Instagram and, and I haven't been to the YouTube. I've listened to your podcast. Um but, the, you know, I find the Instagram little clips really, really helpful um, and your analogies with the, um, you know, the little boxes and the canoe. I used to have a canoe. So that that resonated <laughs> with me, you know, putting the paddle in the water and pushing back. And, you know, I think and I think you have to think about it when you're running. I think a lot of people put headphones in and they put turn the music up so they can go and they don't hear themselves breathing, but they're not paying attention to their running form. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and we have to, you know, have to learn, uh, to, you know, to help out. And, you know, again, so many people get put in orthotics or they get put in different, you know, um, I'm going to buy the thickest socks and the thickest padded shoes to try to help circumvent this stuff and wear all these different funky things. But, uh, if we can just get ourselves lined up, <laughs> Yeah, people will do anything to avoid the act of learning. It's like anything passive like that where you just put something on, wear something. It's not going to automatically. We do need to tap into that act of learning. And maybe we can use the shoes to get feedback for active learning of, hey, did you notice how loud it was when you landed, when, when you did this versus that? We can use those things, but it's not just going to automatically, oh, yeah, I just had the wrong shoes and that was it. Like, it, it, there's more to it, but we need to have active strategies. And that's where there's so much resistance to learning and to new things. So that's my job and goal is to, how can we just make this as easy as possible? Analogies, how can I apply this concept to a concept that you already know and understand so we can just bypass this whole process you just to automate and to truly, uh, to truly learn it. But it doesn't, it doesn't just happen. Yeah, there's, there's, um, you know, it comes back to there's no easy fixes for anything, but if you can have one or two cues and again, focusing on one thing at a time, um, is much better than, you know, um, trying to get everything together because you're just all, all tangled up. I used to golf with my dad and, you know, when things were going bad, everybody, everybody's a golf instructor when your game's bad, you know, and, you know, yeah. I'm like this, you know, lean this way, swing that way. And you're just a knot. <laughs> yeah. And, and yeah. With my like, brain, I tried to golf him for a while. I played baseball my whole life, but I tried getting into golf and I was so overly analytical that I forgot the whole point is hitting the ball and making it go forward. <laughs> I was thinking about a million things. And like, if I just focused on just that one thing, and I try to think that same concept with running of don't try to change all these little things. We're just playing whack-a-mole, like big picture. But I went crazy for a while with golf, <laughs> trying to figure, try to figure out a system with it. But yeah, my, my, uh, best, best games where if you just, you know, you really weren't thinking, uh, you know, yeah. if you would focus on one little thing, you know, I actually, my fourth and fifth finger 
if if I had a day where I just made sure I kept contact with, you know, in my swing or, or even just, I don't want to fall down today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it was always, always the best. So it running is, is, is a good bit like that. So, um, you know, I really appreciate all the, you know, all the, the cool feedback, um, to, you know, to get things straightened around. And, uh, certainly, um, if somebody has an issue, can they send you videos and, you know, or do you take their course or how would you go about if somebody wants to learn from, learn from you? Yeah, I've got, I've got options. And my kind of whole model is I try to provide enough value and information on the social media platforms where there'll be a certain percentage of people. And I've had a lot of good feedback. That's all they needed. And they got that, they got what they needed to be able to run smarter, safer, and faster. But if you want a little bit more, I've got mechanics education or training plans. And I try to have the training plan set up in such a way where it's intervals, the way it's spaced out, where I've had people, they don't, they truly don't want to work on their mechanics. I can't force them. But if they follow this type of structure of training program, they can adapt slowly over time and not get injured. I have uh, one-on-one core, uh, one-on-one sessions where you do, you video yourself, you send it to me. We do a Zoom session like this. I'll um, put your running up on the screen. I'll go through and screen for braking, looking at the posture for bounding, looking at oh, are they going vertical, and then depends on what kind of learner they are. I have three different strategies for teaching people how to run. I have seven steps, seven skills, where I'm pretty much teaching people one skill a day, 10 minutes a day for seven days, pretty much taking the foundations of standing, leaning, walking, and then running, learning them in order. I've got the tennis ball necklace course where we use the tennis ball and we learn those three skills. I call the bronze skill, the arm swing, silver skill skill is the leaning, and the gold skill is the gliding and using the tennis ball necklace. And I have another new course where I pretty much try to make it as streamlined as possible pretty much teaching gliding and gliding is just two parts maximizing momentum through the lean and how we propel ourselves forward with doing the push with the tush and so that's like a five or six day uh, online course where it feels like i'm there with you i video myself we're doing it together or we can do one-on-one too so whatever's best for people i'm still um, I'm back in the clinic four days a week. I'm, you know, treating about 35 hours because I missed being around people. I missed being in person, but it was cool working with people around the world with, they just sent me this video. I have, I send you instructions on how to use a parking lot, a tripod, pretty much how to do it. So it's a standard operating procedure where we get the same footage. And then I give you some kind of action plan or some way to try to address that and answer any other questions or, um, little tidbits that maybe they're holding on to something. And once we let that go, they kind of unlock their, their true potential and get effortless with it. So yes, there's, there's many options available. If you go to learn to run com, I kind of have it. Are you a clinician? Are you a coach? Are you a physical therapist? Are you working on uh, rehabilitation or performance? And then are you a runner? Are you interested in training plans? mechanics or both. And I kind of have it laid out of what each of them is and kind of what you're, what you're looking for. And I also have a video ask link where any of the websites, it pops up a little face of me and I say, Hey, thanks for stopping by. And you can either text video a question and then I can respond with a video. So there's a lot of different ways to get a hold of me. It's easier for me to do a quick video to respond than just typing something. So I'm available. All right. Well, good. That that's very, very cool. So, um, I'm going to try to implement your plan and, uh, when I get injured, I'll start videoing. <laughs> there you go. I'm here for you. But thanks for thanks for what you do as well. Just anytime we can be proactive and we're all in the same business of just trying to help people. And just we know how much it means to us to move and for health and health is wealth and everything. And so we need all aspects of people. So thanks for doing what you do as well. We're, we were meant to move and uh, got to got to move it or lose it. So, yeah. Amen. All right. Thank you very much. My pleasure. It was nice talking to you. Well, I hope you enjoyed the podcast. As Dr. Matt says, run smarter, safer, and faster. So I hope you got some takeaways from that. Um, My big takeaway is lean forward from the ankles, push with the tush, and try to land under your center of mass. I'll be sure and leave links to his, uh, again, Instagram account and YouTube accounts 
If you'd like to learn more about our practice, you can head over to drdelaney.com, D-O-C-T-O-R-D-U-L-A-N-E-Y, to learn what we have to offer. We are going to be offering a special membership that will give people access to our members-only content. So it will be a virtual membership only. There'll be no private contact with Addie and I, but um, you'll have access to our the, the members-only content page, which contains recipes, workouts, um, lectures, videos, cooking demonstrations, and a, and a whole lot more. So if it's $25 a month, it'd be a great Christmas gift. Um, so keep that in mind and, uh, you know, keep track of the page to see when that's available. Uh, hopefully we'll get it up and running before Christmas so you can gift that for the new year. But if you have family or friends that you'd like to learn, have them learn more about your plant-based lifestyle, this would be a great way for them to learn without a huge commitment or at least a trial. Uh, again, a lot of access uh, for um, a very reasonable fee. We also have online memberships where Addie and I speak to you once a month uh, as a coaching membership or just Addie once a month. So um, lots of ways to learn and to hone in your plant-based and wellness journey. We'd love to, love to work with you. If you have questions about any of these, you can email me at jamie at drdelaney.com. It's J-A-M-I at drdelaney.com. Thanks as always for listening. Have a good evening. Thank you.